And Jesus, he says to the paralytic man, he says like, hey, your sins are forgiven. And he says, I want you to get up, take your mat, go home. This man had never walked before. And he has to do it in front of everybody. He had to honor the moment. If this man would have not got up in the moment, if he would have not been willing to struggle in front of people, if he would have not been willing to fail in front of people, he would have never honored what Jesus was trying to do in his life. Jesus brought healing, but he was the one who had to walk it out. This is what it looks like to live a healed life and a courageous life. I think this is what it looks like to live a life honoring what Jesus is doing for you and honoring the moment. We're going to open up God's Word today. Y'all ready to open up God's Word? I have learned that whenever God speaks something, like he can change things in a moment. We are not here to listen to a guest speaker. I'm not going to be that eloquent or even good enough to change your life. But I do know what can change your life. I know that the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, through the words that I speak, can change your life in a moment. And we're here to gather around Jesus Christ who, who died, who was resurrected for our, our forgiveness of sin and redemption. I know that Jesus Christ can change your life in a moment. So as we open up his word, I just want there to be this certain degree of expectation for God to move, okay? As we open up his word, I want you praying about, God, what are you speaking to me? Lord, I hear what he's saying, but God, what are you going to highlight and speak to me? Because I believe that there may be one thing, two things, three things that he'll highlight to you and say, yep, That is actually for you and for this day, okay? So we're going to jump into the Word of God. I don't know about you, but my expectations are high. We're in week two of a series, Walking in Honor, and I believe that God is going to move. Today's message titled is Honoring the Moment. Honoring the Moment. Now, a little bit about me before we begin. Uh, I I have a picture of my family we'll put up here on this screen. I've been married for 10 years now, okay, 10 years now. Shout out to the tech team, production teams. I sent them this photo this morning, and I was like, hey, can we get this one on the screens? You know, I know that in production sometimes it can be hard to make some things happen, but the team was great. They were like, yeah, this is easy. Uh, You'll see that that's my oldest boy right there, Giovanni. Uh, he's, he, uh, we, we prayed for him for years, had him in 2020, it took us about three and a half years to get pregnant, okay? And uh, here we are with him, four years old, just so full of life, so passionate and emotional and funny. You know, at four years old, you're starting to get, to, get a sense of humor and, you know, sarcasm and jokes is kind of where he's at right now. And so he's just life of the party all the way. And then you'll see our youngest boy there, he's got the blonde hair. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Uh, but he looks like me. Like, he looks exactly like me as a baby, just blonde hair, blue eyes. And, um, but he is so cute. He's, like, very strong-willed. And he, like, is a, a man of few words so far. Uh, but he is, like, so strong-willed. It's like, Pierre, do you want to go and do X, Y, Z? And he's like, no. That's just it. There's no, like, reason. You know, with Gio, it was like, no, I want to do this. Pierre is just, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Do you want to go play with this truck then? No. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to figure this out for you, son. Uh, but no, Pierre, he's just the absolute best. Then you'll see that my wife there, her name is Gabrielli, and uh, we've been married for 10 years now. I actually thought uh, on Thursday, I actually thought Thursday was our 10-year anniversary. Uh, but we got married in October. <laughs> we were at Ikea, and I was like, Gabby, I was like, I meant to say this to you earlier first thing, but... Happy anniversary, babe. <laughs> she, she looked at me and she goes, it's September. And I was like, oh, man. Well, I'm early. Okay, I'm early, boo. I'm early. She, uh, she wanted to be here with us today and wanted to be with me today. I'm definitely praying for this moment. Uh, but she's pregnant, y'all. And she is like all the way pregnant right now, okay? Uh, on, on Tuesday, she'll hit 36 weeks. And she like, she, we have a baby girl on the way, okay? And... Um, Gabby's so pregnant right now, she can't breathe. You know, she, like, gets up from, like, the bed and walks to the kitchen, and she's like, I can't. She's like, I gotta sit down. I can't breathe. You know, go walks to the living room. She's like, pause, everybody, pause. I can't breathe. Boo, we love you. We're praying for you, too, okay? We're praying for you. Uh, little baby girl, we're gonna name her Amelia Lou. Amelia Lou. We're gonna call her Ami. Her nickname will be Ami, y'all. I'm, ho- I'm hoping she has red hair. I'm hoping she has red hair. That's my prayer, okay? That's my prayer. I don't know where the red hair will come from, okay? But God can do miracles, y'all. He can do miracles, okay? 
Uh, but anyways, here we go. Let's jump into the Word of God, y'all. Let's jump into the Word of God. We're going to be in Mark. Uh, let's go Mark chapter 2, y'all. Let's jump into Mark chapter 2. Get my iPad open. We're going to be talking about honoring the moment today. I'm excited for what God is going to do. You know, the word honor means to hold in high esteem or have great respect for. And uh, so we're going to be talking through honoring the moment. Here we go in Mark chapter 2. Let me find this. I'm in John right now. Here we go, Mark chapter 2. Let's start in verse, uh, let's start in verse 2, okay? It says, they gathered in such a large numbers that there were no room left for them, not even outside the door. And he, being Jesus, he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not go to him, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the mat, lowered the mat the man was lying on. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Pause here for a second. I, uh, in studying this passage, I never realized this. There are people that believe this was actually Jesus's home that they were in. I always thought like, oh man, I felt sorry for the guy who had his roof ripped open, you know, for the paralyzed man. But then I'm like, ah, it's Jesus's house. You're good. You're good, God. You're good. Verse 6, it says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they were thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to him, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, and he took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Today, we're going to be talking about honoring the moment. Now, up until this moment with Jesus' ministry, okay, Jesus has healed so many, okay? Jesus has already turned water into wine at the wedding. Uh, Jesus has already healed a leper. Jesus actually already healed a paralyzed man previous to this moment. Like, Jesus is going moment by moment, town by town, preaching the good news that the kingdom has now come to you. And there's like starting to be like a buzz about who Jesus is. People are like, oh my gosh, have you heard about Jesus? This would be like Instagram, he's going viral, or on Facebook, he's going viral, on YouTube, it's like the YouTube shorts are just like clicking. He, Jesus is going viral right now, and there's like person after person talking about Jesus. Have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about Jesus so much that whenever Jesus goes back home, they follow him to his house. And he begins to preach, and he begins to teach. It says that there's such a large crowd all around it that it, they're even outside the house just to get a glimpse of what Jesus is speaking. I mean, can you put yourself in this moment, like opening the door, and like let's open up all the windows, and maybe the people all gathered around can hear what Jesus has to say. There is such a buzz in the city and in the community. And there are these four men who have, I'm assuming, to be a friend. I'm assuming a dear friend of theirs who's been paralyzed for years. And they put this man on a mat, and they're bringing him in. And can you imagine them showing up, and they can't even get into the house? They're looking at the space, and they hear, like, Jesus is going to be on the scene. Jesus is coming back home. This is, the, this is the moment. You can get your healing. And they walk up to the house, and they can't even get in. I believe that there are some people that would see this moment as an obstacle. But the beautiful thing about these four men is they actually saw this obstacle as an opportunity for God to do something special. They took this man, and I don't know how they fought through the crowd. You know, like, I don't know, were they rude or were they polite? But they got through the crowd, the crowd with their paralyzed friend and on a mat, and they're, like, pushing their way through, and they can't even get into the door. So they, they grab a ladder, and they climb up on top of the roof. And the Bible says that they actually, like, were digging through the roof to get their friend through obstacle as an opportunity. How do you and I see pushback? 
How do you and I see obstacles? Do we look at these moments and we're like, oh man, this is the, everything is the devil, the devil, the devil. Or do we look at obstacle and think, oh no, no, that means God doesn't want me to do it. Here we see these four men seeing obstacle as opportunity. They knew who God was. They knew who Jesus is. And they were like, if we can just get our paralyzed friend to Jesus, he can heal him. We're believing for the miracle. I love the faith of these four men. Like, I'm telling you, um, you need some friends like this in your life that are just a little bit crazy. They just kind of like have some like good, like, you know, you never know what the, really what they're going to do. You know, I wonder if this man was like, no, no, come on, guys. You can't, ri- you can't rip a hole in Jesus' roof. You know, like, this is Jesus' roof. Nah, man, we got you, okay? You got to get your healing today. You got to get your healing today. But I wonder how many other sick people were in this space. And they showed up to hear Jesus, and they had faith to believe for Jesus to do a miracle, but they wouldn't fight through the crowd to get to him. How many people pulled up on the scene and got to the scene where Jesus was, and they were like, oh, my gosh, the house is full. I can't get in. I'm just going to go home. Healing is not for me. This is too hard. This is too difficult. I'm not going to press in to Jesus. I wonder how many people were in this space, and because they didn't press through, they actually didn't get from Jesus what they needed to get. I wonder how many sick people were outside the house, and because a whole bunch of healed people were inside the house, they couldn't get in. I wonder how many healed people were saying, nope, I'm not going to give up my seat for someone else to get healed. I'm good. I want to hear what Jesus has to say. I'm not leaving this space. I wonder how many people were in the room not going to make room for one more person. Here you see all these different dynamics playing out. I can just imagine some of the commotion and the buzz of Jesus being in this space. And finally, these gentlemen, they rip open the roof and they lower the mat of this man lying on the mat. He's paralyzed and they lower it through. And Jesus pauses. I mean, ripping a hole in the roof is pretty distracting. <laughs> So at this moment, you kind of gotta, you gotta acknowledge what's happening, okay? And he looks at this man, and what does Jesus say to him? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Why did Jesus say this to this man? Could it be that he was most broken, not with his body, but in his heart? Could it be the most damaged part of this man was not his legs that didn't work, but instead a soul inside of him? Could it be that in this moment, Jesus was actually speaking to the place that needed healing the most? A paralyzed man didn't need healing in his body first. Instead, he needed healing inside. And to know that guilt and shame is not going to hold him anymore, that his past does not have to hold him anymore. I wonder the bitterness that this man had walked through for years, being passed by, having to beg on the side of the road, the bitterness of being rejected and, and being passed by. I wonder what had gone on inside of him. And Jesus knew if he was ever going to heal his body, he first had to heal his soul. Now, this is, this is difficult for us to understand sometimes because you don't always see this type of healing. You don't always see uh, the healing inside of a person. And we take the internal healings and the salvation of a soul for granted because it's hard to metric. It's hard to quantify. Like, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to track But here we see that Jesus actually healed this man and gave honor to him regardless of his status, okay? Many times we look at people and we think, oh, they got it all together because they pulled up in a brand new car. They don't need Jesus. They got it. They got everything handled. Or sometimes we look at people like, no, man, these people, they're married for, for five years now, and they, have, they both have smiles on their faces. They just bought their new home, pregnant with baby number two. Like, they're living the American dream. They don't need Jesus. Everything is good for them. Or maybe you look at a person on the side of the road, and they're begging, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this person needs Jesus. But maybe internally they already have Jesus, and they're happy as can be, but they're just going through a difficult time. The thing of it is is that every single one of us, no matter the season of life that we're in, we always are needing Jesus. And this is the beautiful thing about honor. As we talk about honor, honor and giving honor is not about a status. Because you can have a high economic status and not be whole. You can have a great relationship status and not be healed. You can, you can have a wonderful, um, your wonderful reputation and a wonderful status in your community and not everything be right. Every single one of us, no matter the moment or season, we always are needing Jesus. A surrendered status. 
is actually the status that matters most. And here we see Jesus speaking to the man, saying, your sins are forgiven. Knowing that in that moment, he may not walk on earth, but he's going to be leaping on streets of gold in heaven for all of eternity. Jesus saw all to the heart of the man and healed what need to be healed the most. But I wonder how his friends were feeling. Because I don't know if they lowered him through this ceiling to have his sins forgiven. Like I think their expectation was that their friend would walk. And Jesus only deals with the internal up to this point. He looks at the man and he said, your sins are forgiven. How did the four men react? I'll tell you what they didn't do. They didn't pull their friend back through the roof saying, okay, that's all Jesus is going to give. Let's pull you back up. And let's resume life as normal. These four men in this moment, whenever you have such a moment of faith, 20 seconds, y'all, can feel like an eternity. And you would think, Jesus, we just ripped open your roof to heal the obvious. And you're talking about his heart. You're forgiving his sins like, thank you, but not why I'm here, God. I didn't go through all this work and press through the crowds and lo I'm sweating, God. I need this man to walk. I can't pull him back up. And you're healing him just internally. I need you to, I need you to fix these feet, God. And what did these four men do in the moment? They remained. They stayed faithful to what they expected God to do in their lives and in this man's lives. They were not shaken by disappointment. They were not shaken by frustration. They were not shaken by what could be perceived as failure. They stayed in the moment. They honored the moment. They stayed and they remained. And I just wonder how many of us, whenever we go into these moments with Jesus and we're expecting him to meet us in a certain way, but he shows up just a little bit different and we walk away. God, this marriage has been struggling for too long. Man, that fight was too big. This is too difficult. You know, I, re I remember this moment with my wife and I, Gabrielle. We had only been married uh, for a couple years at this point. And I was on staff at Shoreline City, and my wife was on staff at Shoreline City, and um, we were serving and doing everything that we could. But it was like something kind of just like there was like this friction, you know, like, God, are we living in like our purpose? Like, is this, is this what you really have for us? Like, is this season that we're currently in? Like, is this what it's going to look like forever? And there was no friction with our pastors. The, our relationship was, has been great with our pastors. I mean, pastors Ernie are like family to us, okay? We go over to their house for Thanksgiving, okay? I'm not even going to my mom's house for Thanksgiving. I'm going to Pastor Ernie Nika's house for Thanksgiving, okay? I mean, like, they are family to us. So there was no friction with them. And the church was growing, and we were continuing to grow in our leadership capacity. And we were leading teams after team. And, like, from an outside perspective, like, everything looked great. But, like, internally, there was, like, this wrestling of, like, God, like, do you have more for me like do I know that there's more than me for more for me than just this like God what's what's going on here you know have you ever had those moments which is like everything seems good but like internally ah, you know you know and I just there was this moment I'll never forget this it was so awkward um, but it was also so beautiful my wife and I, we were just talking about it, and we were in our first apartment, and we played worship music, and we just kind of held each other, and we cried, and we, like, danced, like, slow danced to worship music. <laughs> I told y'all it was awkward. <laughs> but God just, you know, just, like, held each other, and we're like, Lord, you know, we know you have us. We're not moving. 
I know the promises that you've given me. I, when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ at 19 years old, like you gave me some promises and I'm not going to let go of these promises like right now. Like it doesn't feel right. There's like this friction inside. But I also know this is not the end of the story. I also know that this is just a season. I also know that this is just a moment and I'm going to remain no matter how difficult the pain may be or the confusion may be or the offense may be. I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to remain. Because I know if I don't quit, God, you're not done. You can continue to move. And I'm just not going to let those things, I'm not going to trade in those things that I don't know for what I do know for what I don't know. Like I'm not just, I'm not willing to give it up. Because I know you have a purpose. I know you have a calling. I know you have a destiny. And so this is what I would say, church family. I would say do not give up. Do not be, do not be removed from your post. Do not let offense move you. Do not let, let any kind of confusion move you. Do not let a battle that you're in right now move you from what God has called you to do. You have been called for such a time as this. I'm telling you, revive the best days are ahead. And don't you forget it. Don't give up on it. Don't keep, don't give up on it. Keep contending. Like, keep praying prayers of faith. Don't let your prayers grow small. Keep praying big prayers. Don't let disappointment move you or discouragement move you. Because I'm telling you, Jesus is still in the room. They had lowered their friend on the map, but Jesus was still in the room. Don't let it move you. Don't let it move you. Stay faithful to what God has called you to do. Stay faithful to who God has called you to be. Now, here is something that's really interesting in this moment because the story kind of takes a pause here. And Jesus now starts to address the room. He, he says to, the, to the, the paralytic man, he says like, hey, your sins are forgiven. And then you see here in verse 8, Verse 8, he then turns to the room. It says, immediately Jesus knew what was in their spirit and what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? What? Why are you thinking your th these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. What? Why are you thinking these things? And then Jesus said this statement that has like shook me to the core. I've read this multiple times, okay, but this has never stuck out the way this has stuck out to me before. And this is one of the beautiful things about reading the Bible over and over and over and over and over and over again. This is why you want to keep showing up Sunday after Sunday and after Sunday and go to stretch nights and jump in connect groups. This is why you want to keep on showing up because what the Holy Spirit does is he highlights something in a way he's never done it before. The Word of God is alive and it is active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And as we're gathering together, we're not having an expectation on me. We're expecting for God to speak and that His Spirit would speak through His Word. And you see here in this moment, in this verse, verse 10, it says, But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority. Revive Church, I just want to remind you today that the Son of Man has authority. Jesus has authority. You may have 99 problems, but Jesus doesn't have one. He has authority. Like this is who he is. What does Jesus have? He has authority. He is Alpha. He is Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. From the beginning of all things, he was still I am. And no matter what you're going through, no matter the strife or the circumstance, no matter what your marriage may look like, no matter what the doctor report may look like, no matter what your job may look like, no matter what your friend groups may look like, no matter how crazy your kids are acting, no matter how difficult it may be in the community, Jesus has authority. He is not giving it up. Jesus doesn't have doubt. Jesus doesn't have worry. Jesus doesn't have an empty bank account. Jesus has authority for you and for me. He has authority. And he can heal your body. He can heal your mind. 
He can heal your emotions. He can cause you to stand up. Jesus has authority to forgive sins. You feel guilt. You feel shame. You sinned this past week. There's still forgiveness in the cross of Jesus Christ. You are not too far away. This is the scandalous thing about the cross of Jesus Christ is that it can reach into the heart of every single man or woman, no matter how far you have ran from God. He is still pursuing you every single step of the way. Jesus has authority. Why are you thinking these things? Why are you thinking these things? Why, like, why are you thinking these things? I just, though, I just found myself like, Eric, why would you ever doubt? Like, Eric, why would you ever struggle? Is God good? Like, Eric, why would you ever feel like, Lord, do you see me? Do you know me? Do you feel what I'm feeling? Like, do you know the things that I'm thinking? Lord, do you see the struggles that I'm going through in this moment? Like, but Jesus is saying, why are you thinking these things? Why, why, like, why, 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 Eric? Like, why are you thinking these things? Church family, like, why are you thinking that Jesus cannot handle what you're going through? Why would you ever feel like Jesus cannot pursue that son who has been running from, from God for years? Why would you ever feel like Jesus can't heal your cancer? Why would you ever feel like Jesus can't handle your doubt? Why, like, why, why would you ever feel like you're not seen? Why, why would you ever feel like you're not cared for? Why would you not feel like you're not valued? The cross has already declared your value. Why would you be thinking these things? Why, why would you wrestle with these things? Why, why are you thinking these things? And I just want to remind you that Jesus Christ has authority and he is in control of every season and every single circumstance. I want to look every single person in the eye and remind you that Jesus has authority over your life and every season and every difficulty and every moment. He has authority over your finances and he has authority over your business and your company and your friend groups. He still has authority and he is for you. He is on your side. He is called you for such a time as this. The calling and the purpose that is on your life has not been moved. He is with you. He hears your prayers. He sees the tears. Every single moment, Jesus is with you, and he has not lost authority. He has the power to heal and to save and to redeem and to bring back together. He has the authority of it all. This is the Jesus that we serve. He has authority. You know, the interesting thing, you know, Jesus, uh, whenever he, uh, you know, he rose from the grave and he's now speaking to his disciples, he says, all authority has been given to me. And then what's his next word? Go. Go. And here you see in this moment, he's talking to this paralyzed man. And he reminds everybody in the room, I'm the one that has the authority over this moment. Your doubts don't dictate what's going to happen to this man. Your fears don't dictate what's going to happen to this man. The room, y'all may be a little funky, but it doesn't matter what, what Jesus is wanting to do with this man. And here you see Jesus now turns to the man and he says, I want you to get up, take your mat, go home. Get up, take your mat, and go we read this, and typically whenever you see this moment, like in your head, you know, you're like, sorry, I'm going to bend down here, okay? You're like, the man's like this, and Jesus is like, get up, take your mat, and the guy's like, ooh. <laughs> Roll it up. Thank you, four fellas. Um, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Is that how y'all saw it in your head? Because that's how I've always seen it in my head, you know, like, it's just like, whoop, you know, like. Just walk right on out. Deuces. I don't need to hear anything else from Jesus. I'm good. He told me to go, excuse me. Excuse, you can get your healing too. Excuse me. Excuse, you know, just <laughs> walks with like this new confidence and swagger. But here's the thing. This man had never walked before. He had to walk in front of everybody. He didn't know how to walk. He didn't know how to do it. Ooh. Have you ever been there? Y'all. Jesus tells you to do something, and you're like, I've never done that before. 
Mm -hmm. He does it all the time, okay? God does this all the time. It's frustrating, and I've just learned, um, I've learned to appreciate it and be scared at the same time and try to have enough courage, you know, uh, because it leaves room for the Holy Spirit, and that's why I'm not God. He's God, you know, so, like, he keeps telling me to do things that I can't do. Lord, complicated, but thank you. <laughs> but here you see Jesus tells this man, get up, and he has to do it in front of everybody. You know, we say, uh, I, you know, uh, I get to one of the teams that I lead um, is our service department, and uh, we get to, you know, uh, worship tech production and so we do a, a service run through an hour before service and so because we say like we don't practice on people and so we like we make sure that we're prepped as we come into it for a Sunday morning service but this man couldn't practice by himself on how to walk he had to just do it for the first time in front of everyone and his four friends they couldn't help him they're on the roof they're like bruh you got it Come on. <laughs> you got this one, man. Come on, man. You better get up. You better get up. But what if he wouldn't have? What if he would have said back to Jesus, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to get up. I don't know how to walk. I think this, uh, this moment probably looked a little bit more like, you know, just sh a shaky. You know? It probably fell a couple times. He's like, y'all mind your bit. Don't make fun of me. Don't y'all mind your business. I'm trying here, you know. He probably fell. He's using muscles he's never used before. He's using muscles he never had before. Oh, oh, this, this is what it's like to have calf muscles. Oh, okay. Oh, this is what it's like to have thigh muscles. I never knew. Stands up. Then he's got to bend back down to pick up his mat. Because he can't leave his mat. Because Jesus said, pick up your mat. Jesus, you're complicated. <laughs> what if he fell down again? Trying to get his mat. You see this? This is what life looks like, y'all. He just picks picks up his mat I wonder if this was awkwardly long like this right now I wonder Jesus just stood there watch this man do this the whole time you know two minutes something like this is all that's eternity but this is what it's like Jesus heals you but you got to live it out this man, his whole life has changed because he's no longer a beggar. He's got to get a job. He's no longer paralyzed. He's got to walk. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to wait on other people to come and pick him up. Now he's got to figure out his own schedule and walk to where he needs to go next. But before, he just went to where he had to wait until people came. Rolls it up. Gets up. He starts walking. This is what it looks like to live out healing. He had to honor the moment. If this man would have not got up in the moment, if he would have not been willing to struggle in front of people, if he would have not been willing to fail in front of people, he would have never honored what Jesus was trying to do in his life. Jesus brought healing, but he was the one who had to walk it out. And I wonder, I wonder how shaky these first steps were. I wonder how awkward it all was. But I think this is what it looks like to live a healed life and a courageous life. I think this is what it looks like to live a life honoring what Jesus is doing for you. And honoring the moment. I've never had to deal, deal with conflict before. I've always just like, I've always swept it under the rug. But a healed me has to deal with this conflict. I, I've been married for years, and we've never prayed together. And I'm nervous to pray with this woman. I'm nervous to pray with this man because we've never prayed together. But a healed me has to do it. I, I've, I've never served in church, but a healed me has to serve in church. I've never trusted God with my finances. I've never tithed. I've never went above and beyond. I've never given them a stretch offering before. But Jesus has healed me, and I have a testimony 
this looks a little bit awkward as I'm trying to give. Never, this feels weird. It feels weird to give. But Jesus, you've healed me and you've blessed me. Jesus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give. Like healed me has to do it. I've never trusted God in the way I've trusted Him. I've never lifted my hands in worship, y'all. The first time you lift your hands in worship, it just feels weird. Okay, it's not weird, but it feels weird. Okay, I've never lifted my hands in worship, but it healed me has to do it. I've, I've never taken off my mask in community. I've always lived a guarded life, and I've never really let someone in. But you know what? A healed me has to do it. I've never done these things where I've been afraid to fail in front of people, but a healed me has to do it. I've never gone through res um, resolved conflict. I mean, every time that I've gotten a disagreement with my wife before, I give her the silent treatment for three days, and then we act like it never happened. But a healed me has to do it. I've never woke up early and served my kids and made them breakfast before, but you know what? A healed me has to do it. I've never showed up to a connect group before. This is weird, church people gathering on a Wednesday. I want to watch some basketball on a Wednesday or a Sunday night. I want to watch football or Saturday morning. I want to watch football, but you know what? A healed me has to do it. And if you're wanting if you're wanting to be the person that God has called you to be, you're going to have to take some steps that you've never taken before. And you need to be okay with it being awkward. And you need to be okay with failing. And you need to be okay with falling. Because you need to have this conviction on the inside of you that Jesus has healed me. And a healed me has to do it. I can't live the same as I've lived before because I'm different. I wonder if Jesus would have never healed this man's soul and forgiven him of his sins if he would have ever felt like he was worthy of walking. I just wonder, is that the reason why Jesus did it? You notice that the man did not leave the space and the house the same way he got there. He came through the roof. He left through the front door or a window. But he didn't go back through the roof. And I just want to remind you, church family, for what God has called you to do and what God is wanting you to be and what God has put on this church family and on your lives individually, you're going to have to do some things different than what you've done before. There's going to be a different demand on your heart. There's going to be a different demand on your emotions. You're going to have to have hard, hard conversations like you've never had before. You're going to have to be able to forgive quicker than you ever have before. You're going to need to be able to not like hold, um, you're going to be, have to be able to hold things loosely and be like, I was on the usher team and now I'm on the host team, but they need me on the parking team and now I'm going to jump on the worship team and then I'm going to jump in next gen. You're going to be able to hold things loosely. What God has for you, you need to keep the main things the main things. But get, to get where you need to go, you can't do what you've done before. And you have to walk out your life healed and do it afraid, doing it not knowing the answers. Revive Church, I wonder what it would look like if every single one of us, God spoke the things, same things to our hearts and we were willing to get up and do it shaky. And to get up and do it afraid and make the investments, even though we're not totally sure. But I'm like, man, God, I feel like you're in this. And we keep showing up on Sunday after Sunday being like, I don't even know what I'm doing on the host team, but I'm just going to keep on showing up. I play the piano, but I like barely play the piano. And like, do you need me? You know, can I just say this? The first place I served on our church, okay, I showed up and I had like long hair and it was up in a ponytail. And the first place I, uh, I served was on the bass. I can't play the bass. <laughs> okay. But bad bass is better than no bass, okay? <laughs> I played the bass. But it's going to require more of us. What would it look like as a church family if we walked out our healing? What would it look like as a church family if we honored every moment, realizing that Jesus is in the space and he's wanting to do something through you? Not through the person to your left, not through the person to your right, not at you in 10 years from now, not you from 10 years ago. He wants to honor this moment. 
So God, I pray for every single person in the room. I pray for our online family. God, I thank you that your hand is on their life. God, I'm asking that you would bless them. God, I'm praying your favor to be upon them. God, I'm declaring that no weapon formed against them would prosper. Jesus, I'm asking that as you heal us and you speak to us, God, I'm asking that we would move. God, I'm praying that you would surround us with friends who will rip open roofs for us and push us forward to be everything that you have called us to be. God, I'm also asking that we would get up and we would grab our mats and we would go and be everything that you have called us to be. Jesus, I'm asking that you would remind us that you have all authority in heaven and in earth. You have the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and you are on our side. God, I pray that we would be reminded that, Jesus, you are alpha and you are omega, and everything that you have begun, you will also finish. So, God, I'm just praying your hand a blessing and favor over this church family. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen, amen.